This is Distant Replay, the podcast that goes back in time to relive all the greatest events that we witnessed in sports. From upsets, to championships, to cultural moments, we discuss it all. Coming up on today's episode... Well, our tour of the 1973 Triple Crown by Secretariat continues with the Preakness on this episode of Distant Replay. We go back to May 19th, 1973 is when Secretariat went into the Preakness as the favorite and took home the second leg of the Triple Crown. Now, we're at the week of the Preakness in 2021, which is why we're doing it. We're doing it uh, on schedule with the actual Triple Crown event itself so that we're going back to one of the greatest horses. Uh, what I mean, one of the greatest horse of all time. And Secretariat showed it once again. I am Ben George. He is Mike Noto. I enjoyed this one, Mike. Another uh, five-part video that we'll have on the website. It's short, sweet. But it, it kind of keeps you entertained for all, it's only about 45 or 50 minutes total. But it was a lot of fun going back to this one. Yeah, we had some continuity with the broadcast team from the Kentucky Derby race mm -hmm. a few weeks prior, which we'll get to. And overall, just a solid, another solid TV broadcast. And again, very similar to how you see these races uh, put on TV today. And look, maybe it started back then. The, the formula is tried and true, so why screw around with it? We're going to go through the race itself. Obviously, the, the the broadcast talent, we will talk about them as well. They caught our attention in the first broadcast. Now we feel a little more invested catching them a second time. Uh, very some similar similarities between this one and the Kentucky Derby. Uh, also, the race itself was a, an impressive performance by Secretariat, but there was some controversy following this race that actually blew up quite a bit. I had not remembered or heard about this, although it does have a conclusion that didn't happen too long ago almost, what, 40 years later, but it was a pretty big deal. So we'll go th all through all that on this episode of Distant Replay. We're going to put it up online, the race itself, the broadcast on CBS. It'll be on distantreplaypodcast.com. Connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, but also on YouTube. Go ahead and hit that follow, hit that like button. We would appreciate that as well. Leave us a comment, your thoughts of the race, if you go back and watch it yourself and any other events you want us to go back and watch. So, as I mentioned, May 19th, 1973, almost 50 years, Mike, since this race happened. We come into the CBS broadcast, and I like it because it's only it's it's like 30 minutes to post time when they come in. There's not all the, you know, the hemming and hawing and all just the filling hours and hours ahead of time. We get straight into the point. And Jack Whitaker, who now we you know we're very familiar with now, after seeing him there, we told you last episode we did on the Kentucky Derby a couple weeks ago that he was the guy that got kicked out of the Masters essentially for calling the gallery a mob. Uh, instead of patrons, but got reinstated later. That's how we knew him. But he did a great job in that first broadcast. And here again, he has a tremendous open to this broadcast where they spotlight the infield. Again, as you can imagine, tons of people, record crowd on hand for Secretariat. A lot of hype on this race. Although the, the crowd was only 61,000, it was still a record, I think, at the time. But he goes through the infield, mic on just like it was like a soliloquy, like a poem that he was reading off, describing the infield and the atmosphere and the fans. There was a shot of a makeshift toilet in the middle of the infield, just a pot with like a just like a sheet over it. They had people playing a lacrosse game, like legit pads playing lacrosse in the infield, which is so Maryland. They had a farewell to Johnny Unitas during this open. It had everything. You you hit it on the head. He intertwined Johnny Unitas a toilet in the middle of the infield and lacrosse all into an open for a horse race. It was incredible. It, it, it really was incredible. He did, he did an excellent job with it and it got you kind of weirdly pumped up for the race Yeah. because when we, I think of the Preakness more than any of the other, um, maybe because I've been there, I've been to the Preakness and in the infield. Mm -hmm. When I think of the infield for a triple crown race, I think of the Preakness. Do you? Yeah, because it's notoriously like an awesome party, dude. Okay. I mean, Churchill's awesome. the same way. I, I, yeah, I just I've think never been to Churchill. But... Yeah, I've never been to Churchill. That's probably why. And and I think of the Preakness as more of like a party. Yeah. I think I just, I have in my mind, I think of the Kentucky Derby as more of like a uh, 
like a high society event. But I could be way off on that. Yeah, Enfield is not. Enfield is is definitely a uh, it is a madhouse, and it is the common man, Mike. They're not. They're not, they're not playing lacrosse. Like I, it was. <laughs> I was so surprised that there was that much space. They said it was a record crowd, sixty one thousand and change was the official attendance. So it seems on the low side. I think it was like ninety or a hundred for the Derby uh, a couple yeah. weeks prior to this. So it there seemed, was. And it didn't seem like the the infield was packed, and it could have been if they were literally playing a game of lacrosse. With full pads and goals and everything, it wasn't on the regulation side field. It didn't seem like, but either way, it it wasn't it wasn't completely packed, you know, um, shoulder shoulder to shoulder or anything like that. Yeah, but your man Jack Whitaker brought it in this open, and we have the same cast of characters he introduces you at the it. end of his little soliloquy. Your boy Haywood and Chick. Haywood, Chick, and I. Uh, it's right. The guy's last name is Wright. The guy who announces the actual race. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and kind of tying this back into our first Kentucky Derby, Chick Anderson, he reminded me of Ch- uh, Champ Kynes. I, yeah, there you that, go. That, I, I couldn't remember his name last time. But, whammy. Um, but whammy, yeah. So, anyway, back to this. So, you had the great open, right? Obviously great. Then you had the introducing of the field. Remember last time the Derby in 73, they actually had artists paint each horse and the jockey on top. And they had that shown as they went through the entire field. Now this is only a six horse field, much shorter, but they basically had like the daily racing form up in the background. Yeah, like a like a faded copy of the daily racing form. And you had Chick Anderson sitting there reading it. And good thing he's so articulate when he spoke, because you couldn't see anything that that daily racing form said. No. no you nothing. couldn't make out any you could tell how many, like roughly how long the horse's name was, but you couldn't make out any of the letters. And you could tell how many horses were in the field, probably only if you'd read, read a uh, daily racing form before. Like, you knew the layout of the, the actual page. You could probably exactly. kind of sort it out. But if you hadn't, pro- you probably didn't know what you were looking at. Yeah, if you weren't looking for, like, the bold names that tell you what the name of the horse is, you're right. You basically had no clue. But Ben brings up a good point. This Preakness is kind of like the Preaknesses we know these these days. More than 15 horses in the Derby in 1973, followed by – a six horse field in the Preakness. So, uh, but give Sham credit because Sham, I think these days, if a horse had s- such a good outing, a, a good outing like Sham did in the Derby, I think in today's horse racing, that horse would have sat out the Preakness and then came and tried to win after Secretariat in the Belmont. So give Sham credit for running in this race. Yeah, he he did. A, he was obviously the, the, the second favorite, the only horse really that anybody expected to compete with Secretariat. I mean, if you go back and even leading into this broadcast or leading into the race, they were talking about, you know, essentially it, it's Secretariat and Sham and then every other horse that's in there, you know, just was part of the field. So it wasn't an expectation that anybody was really going to threaten Secretariat outside of Sham. And as they're going through this again, you had Haywood, your man Haywood on the track and, a, and another, another incredible jacket. Uh, he had, a fashion sense that was probably carried on by Craig Sager later on down the down the road. That's the best way I can describe it. He's just a smooth guy, you know. Very, and very I'll colorful. You, very colorful. And you know what the difference between these guys is? I don't know if it's they're more well prepared or they were just trained differently as broadcasters back then. But they sort of transition into different make make like really like poignant analogies. Transition from one sentence to another a lot more clear. They, they seem to know a lot about the event they're covering. I don't know enough. I know Jack Whitaker wasn't just a horse racing guy. I don't know enough about Haywood or Chick to know if they're just horse racing guys, but they're just so so knowledgeable about what they're talking about, you know, um, and it really it really comes through on the broadcast. Yeah, it does. They did a great job, and it is, you know, Haywood's got great access, too, on the track. Yeah, he's, you know, they're they're on the track getting getting all the horses saddled up and prepared getting on, doing through all their final checks and putting on blinkers and whatnot and he, he's literally walking horse to horse and and chatting with trainers you know minutes before this race goes off but there is one one part of this that I thought was that made me laugh he's ta- I don't remember which horse it was but one of the horses had to have his tongue tied and I, didn't, I I'm not really aware of them doing this to horses I I don't know if they still do it to horses but he's essentially like like Haywood's literally like feet away. Like when the camera the camera the camera's in the face of the horse, like dude, trying to get right, in position. Dude, right in the face of the horse. And like they, they cut to a shot away from it, you know, like a, a shot, like a far shot. And you can see like Haywood 
and the cameraman like battling for position on the track, right? And I'm sure it's like not making the horse any more comfortable. But this whole time, Hay was describing it. I don't remember who he's talking with. You know, the so and so is doing the tongue tie. It's probably a vet. I don't. I don't remember who. But while he's doing this, he's got his whole fist in this horse's mouth, <laughs> like halfway down his throat, trying to tie like a rag or something onto this horse's tongue to tie his tongue down. And the whole time, like, Haywood's saying, yeah, this is very humane. This is very normal. And the whole time, the horse looks like it's gagging and trying to do all it can to get this this, this person's hand out of its mouth. And I, I was just like, there's no way this thing is allowed anymore. This this seems like it would get a ton of attention if this was on a broadcast. You know, we're in a week here where there's some shady stuff going on with the uh, trainer uh, who won the Kentucky Derby, right? So yeah. that's the first thing I thought of is like, it's not along the same lines, but you know what I mean? But the, you, I was waiting for either the guy who was doing whatever he was doing to the horse or the horse to kick Haywood or punch him or something. Yeah. It seemed like he was just like way too like close to what was going on and that he was almost like getting in the way. There, there wasn't like, yeah, they, they didn't have like, it didn't feel like they had great control of the situation. Like the horse is like in the middle of like a crowd of people. And it definitely could not have made the horse comfortable or calm. Yeah, I'm surprised like nobody did get get kicked at some point. I just love how Haywood goes right up to people, and he's like, "Hey, how do you like your horse today? <laughs> think he's gonna do a good job?" Like he's trying to talk like all like calm and like he's like, "What do you think? What do you think your horse's chances today?" It's just like I just love it. Not he's in like too. a nice calm voice, kind of you know. You know, feel, feeling these people out like minutes before, you know, the biggest race they're ever a part of in their lives. It's just, I just, I love everything about Haywood. I do too. He's great. All right. So the other thing was the Maryland, my Maryland, right? We, we know with uh, my old Kentucky home, we talked about that last broadcast, how we learned that they actually play it as soon as they step on the track. So Maryland, my Maryland, this song actually, and I, I'd kind of forgotten this, but this song stopped being played uh, last year in 2020. They no longer play it before the race. There was a controversy. Uh, around it, Mike. Go really? figure. Go figure. Yeah. Um, I didn't. I honestly, I honestly didn't know that. I didn't. Uh, I'll pay attention this week because the Preakness is in a couple days here. But okay, go ahead. Yeah, it was part of an issue. You know, tied into issues of race and racism. I, I don't know. Going back, it's a state song and it's been played there since 1909. Um, but 2020 was the first time it was not played in over a hundred years. For the race, so uh, and according to the story I read last fall, that it won't, it probably won't be around anymore. So we'll see if it actually happens. I haven't read anything about it, but I did think it was interesting because I, I've heard the song plenty, right? And you had as well. But I thought it was very interesting the way this song ended. I'm going to play you a little clip from this because it sounded like it went from like the state song to like a an advertisement for the Preakness. Listen in. All right, right here. So it goes to like a remix. That obviously can't be part of Maryland, my Maryland. I, I, I'm assuming now, listen to it again. It had to have been like just the same chorus, just transitioned seamlessly from Maryland, my Maryland to some Preakness anthem. But it reminded me of like I was sitting like you'd be sitting in a movie theater back when we used to go to movie theaters before COVID. And like they play like that, that little that little Coke and popcorn jingle before the movie starts, like really gets you up and gets you out to get a drink one last time before the movie starts. I just that that thing like caught me off guard when I heard it. I thought it was hilarious. That should be like the jingle for all time at Pimlico for the Preakness. So when they're running commercials for the Preakness, they should play bits and pieces of that jingle. That was awesome. Did they say pancakes and beer? <laughs> I heard cold beer. I, I thought but, it was pancakes and cold beer. Yeah, cold I didn't beer hear and pancakes. pancakes. <laughs> that's some combination. Maybe that's why there's the toilet in the infield. Maybe they said crab cakes. That would make more sense. It would. Maryland, some lacrosse. Crab cakes. Oh, man. And some cold beer. Some Sounds nat- about right. Some Natty Bow. Some Natty Bow, man. <laughs> oh, man. You're walking around winking all night when you're drinking Natty Bow. 
That's, that's incredible. So that was played, obviously, right before the race started, you know, about ten, about five minutes before the race got underway. So to the race we go, Mike. And, and again, uh, only a six-horse field. It's very small. Secretariat uh, got off to a slow start out of the gate, a very just casual run out of the, the starting block. Ecole Taj, who they talked about would be the fast horse out of the gate, shot out, shot out to the lead, right? Probably had, you know, was was three links out in front of the field while Secretariat was pulling up the rear. Again, not that far back, but again, last place going into that first turn. But boy, that first turn, Secretariat was just like, you know what? I, I have no reason to sit back here and play around. I'm going to turn it on. And he did, and he made a move from last to first, and it seemed like a matter of about – 10 seconds to get to get to that lead. I know it's cliche. I know it's cliche, but it's, it really seemed like when he made his move for, again, for being in last. So being in sixth place, it seemed like all the other horses were standing still. And you forget that like, all right, these are all war. These, all these other horses are world-class horses and he's making them seem like they're standing still. And he blitzes right to the front uh, at the lead and doesn't let go from there. And I thought, I don't know about you, Ben, I thought this performance by Secretariat was more impressive than the Derby. Yeah, we know it comes. So it's it's almost like he got better every race, right? Um, I I agree with that, too. And Sham, I mean, Sham, the main competition here, made made a push. But I I kind of felt like Sham was just trying to keep up and and just had to kind of take off earlier than probably he wanted to because Secretariat had pulled to the lead so quickly and – was kind of pulling away a little bit. And it was kind of one of those, I got to go now to try to keep this thing even close at all. And he was able to kind of stay with Secretariat a little bit, but never threatened down that home stretch. Yeah, and Secretariat was actually gaining steam down the stretch. So, you know, he ended up winning by, I think it was like four lengths. Had that race been a little bit longer, he probably would have won by five or six, one of those kind of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was just in top-notch form. I thought Lafitte Pinkai's interview, so Lafitte Pinkai, the legendary jockey, if you remember from last time, he's the jockey riding Sham. I thought his comments post-race were very, very eye-opening. Yeah. You know, he basically said, my horse is giving everything he has, my horse is running a good race, but we're still not even close to this horse. Right. And he, he pretty much insinuated, they asked him uh, if he was going to go get ready for the Belmont. And he said something like, well, I don't think we're going to beat this horse, but we'll be ready for the Belmont. Hmm. So this is where we're all coming to the realization here. You could tell in the broadcast, it's a little bit different tenor than the last race. Last race it was, well, he lost a Wood Memorial as a prep race. Is he, right. is he the real deal? Today it was like, we're pretty sure we're watching like a legendary horse, so enjoy it. Mm-hmm. And then now after the race, it's like, wow, this horse is one of the best we've ever seen. And can he be the first horse in decades to win the Triple Crown? And one thing about this broadcast, though, I, I give them credit for, Ben, is although they know they have a, probably have a super horse in Secretariat, the whole pre-show is not just about that one horse. Yeah. If Like nowadays, you know, if a horse wins the Derby, a large part of that hour and a half or two-hour pre-show they have is all about that one horse and you don't really get a feel for, you know, the rest of the field. Yeah. I think that's fair. That's pretty, pretty good observation on your end on that. They, they did do a good job of kind of keeping it fair, presenting everybody kind of equally. Uh, one other thing I made note of on the, on that race down out of that final turn, the infield, they had pretty incredible access when the horses came out of that, that final turn. Like there were fans that were basically up on the rail. They they were smart enough to not be there as soon as things happened, and I don't know if that was them being smart enough or they were pushed back or what. But like a couple fans ran up to the rail, like like cheering on the horses. That that did not seem very safe to me. That didn't seem safe, and I don't know if you remember. Right after the race, they interviewed interviewed Lucian Lauren. They interviewed uh, Penny Tweedy, the owner. They interviewed Ron Turcott, and the fans were literally right behind them. Yeah. Like making like funny faces at the camera and stuff. That was a very odd scene that everything, like you said, was kind of all on top of each other. When you have all that room at a horse track, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And everyone was all on top of each other in that one area um, near where uh, they were interviewing, you know, all the different parts of the winning team there um, for uh, Secretariat. 
Yeah, just an odd. Some of the you know some of the ways they do things in these in these older broadcasts kind of leave you scratching your head, but. Overall, I thought it was solid. There just wasn't any uh, concerns in terms of security back then. You know, obviously it was a different age, Mike, and the fact that they didn't really have anybody protecting the rail. And I mean, all those natty bows, anybody could have jumped on the course or the track and just like gotten in the way. I mean, there was literally nothing to stop them from doing that. It didn't. You, appear. I mean, you you bring up a good point about the security because there's a lot of points in these older g- events we do where you kind of cringe a little bit, like, hey, what's going on here? Yeah. Because now there's such a separation between people participating in a sporting event and people watching it. And it, when you don't see that natural separation that we have now, it kind of gives you pause for concern. Mm-hmm. And I think I'm trying to think of the moment that all changed. Was it with the, was it, what was it? Monica Sellis that got stabbed that time? Yeah, may, it might've been that. I mean, obviously nine 11, you know, sparks a lot of that, but I think, yeah, I think somewhere in the nineties that probably uh, took a turn. And I think it just kind of evolved over time, but yeah, I mean, it's or maybe maybe with our test, maybe could be, yeah. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that may, I don't know if there that, was that wasn't incident. that long ago, relatively speaking. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. It's probably a cumulative thing. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, there's definitely a different different era, and you do cringe some when you see how close some of these these fans get, and because you're just expecting the worst, like we see now. But so when the race was over, by the way, so Secretariat official time on the scoreboard was a, uh, a minute fifty five. That's what they posted at the track. Not enough to break the record. They didn't make. They didn't really talk about it much in the broadcast. They went to the interviews, closed it out, were gone. But reading up on this race afterwards, so apparently there were a couple people in the press box that were hand timing it. They had a, a, a an electric timer on the track that actually shot a laser beam across the track, and as soon as the horse broke the laser beam, that's what would trigger the time. So that. And in theory, was much more accurate. Now, I don't know exactly what happened, but when the time checked out at 155, these guys in the press box looked down at their watches. And it wasn't like they were off by a tenth of a second or, uh, you know, two tenths of a second. They looked down, and it's like a second and a half difference between what they had on their their watches versus what the track had. So a couple of these guys reached out to Lucian Lauren, Secretary's trainer, and told him, hey, listen, we, we have this as a track record, it looks like, according to our unofficial times. Now, the track's saying differently, but Lucian Lauren immediately kind of made a, 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 bit, a bit of a stink over this, asked for the videotape to be reviewed because he felt like if he did run that fast, he deserves this record, and there's enough here to, to, to merit a review on this. Now, Pimlico actually had somebody there, like a steward that was timing it, that didn't mention anything, but he had a discrepancy in his time, too. Didn't mention it for whatever reason, a day later they, they talked to him and he said, yeah, actually I did have a different time anyway, but it wasn't as fast as the other guys. So it wasn't the record. They were like, well, is it that big of a deal? It's not the record, you know, no big deal. But they said, according to Maryland rules of racing, that the official time, official timers time is the, is official for this race. So it kind of stood up like that, but the owner, Penny uh, Chinnery and uh, the Maryland jockey club president asked for them to review this 1973 Preakness. I mean, it was such a big deal, Mike, that right after this, not not too long after, I would imagine this is probably sometime before the Belmont was run that year. But CBS actually ran a 30-minute special on this controversy where they actually went frame by frame and compared them to Cannonero 2, who had the previous record a couple years prior. They actually had that race and kind of, I guess, overlaid it. And we kind of frame by frame and compared the the that time with Secretariat's race to see who actually finished first. And the network even seemed to believe that Secretariat broke that record. And it became just this big national controversy. Now he went on to win the Belmont, which we'll watch again and we'll talk about in a, in a couple of weeks here on the podcast. And you know, it was kind of just up in the air, it seems like, that nothing ever was nothing was ever settled from this, from what I can tell. But eventually in 2012, the Maryland Racing Commission actually finally ruled that in their findings, the tapes of Secretariat's run, they watched it, and it was actually a new record. They put it down. They moved it from a minute 54 and two-fifths of a second, which was the the other time they had, to a minute 53, which actually broke the the record of a minute 53 and two-fifths seconds. So almost 40 years later, after all this, Secretary got the record, and I don't remember. I mean, that's not long ago. I don't remember that being news much at all that I paid attention to. 
you know, classic horse racing sort of, uh, you know, screwing this up, you know what I mean? And, and recognizing it 40 years later. I mean, so for people who have a problem with the sport, you know, this is part of the thing that they, uh, they get caught up on, but look, this is one, this is something where that's an amazing story, by the way. And just when you think like the legend of secretariat couldn't be any bigger, imagine if, you know, in the 40 years from 1973 till they acknowledge it in 2012, you not only had this super horse and secretariat break the record at Churchill, break the record at Belmont, but also now break the record at the Preakness. Yeah. So you have a triple crown winner who, who, who broke all three records at each of the tracks. I mean, that would have enhanced his legacy even more. Mm-hmm. The crazy part is, like, just kind of reading through the story that, that the commission actually held a hearing that July, like that year. Like, it's a big deal. That summer held the, held the, the hearing. They had testimony from like a long list of experts. They even had the producer from CBS. They watched multiple recordings of the race and the race from 1971. In that first time around, they eventually voted unanimously to deny the request. They said it was bound by its rules and regulations, which provide the official time of any race, which is clocked by the official timer. And they even added <laughs> to, to change the time now, even given the evidence that they had at the time showing that the timing was incorrect. They said it would be destructive of the integrity of all sporting events. To correct it was destructive of the integrity. That's what they said at the time. Almost 40 years later, they went back and reversed that 7 to nothing to change the time. You know, all these, a lot of these sports always bring up integrity when you're asking them to admit when they do something wrong, right. if you ever notice right. that. It's kind of a common thread, but not just horse racing. Yeah, pretty nuts. But that actually happened. And, and so 2012, at that point, Secretariat held the record at the Preakness, which I still believe stands today, Mike. So just to, just to speak to how incredible it was. Now, I don't – I would imagine, too, now, I don't know the exact timing here. But, again, we talked about it in the first time that Sham actually had the second fastest time ever at the Derby. If Secretariat was at a minute 53 and two-fifths, I got to think he was – that Sham was pretty close to being second fastest, if not, like, definitely top five fastest race ever at the Preakness. And, again – came up short. I mean, I, I know I'm kind of like hammering home that, that Shan was maybe the greatest. I'm like, I'm kind of getting to the point where Shan was the, like the greatest horse that never won a, a, a triple crown race. Um, but the more I watch him compete with Secretariat, the more I kind of feel that. Now we'll see how the, the Belmont plays out because I don't remember what Sham did in that race. But at this point, I'm like, man, this horse accomplished a ton and it's forgotten about. Yeah, so it, it's one of those things where you always hear how good of a horse Sham was. And if you watch these races, you're like, huh. Eh. You know, these first two races, you know, Secretariat won pretty easily, I thought. Yeah. Right? But you remember, you got to compare Sham to years prior and those horses prior because no one compares to Secretariat. And I can't believe you don't remember what happens in the Belmont. Uh, you are going to be blown away. We'll just – I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I, I came away from this race also saying Secretariat is just on a different planet, but Sham is – a very worthy second place. So I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all I got for the race, Mike. Anything else you want to add before we get out of here? Nope. I can't wait to watch his performance in the Belmont because I have some thoughts on his performance in the Belmont, and um, I can't wait to see what you think of it. Yeah, I, I, I know how that race played out. I mean, I think that's the one we always see. But I don't know how everything unfolded, and I don't, I don't remember the entire race. But I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing the CBS broadcast and our boys Jack Chick and Haywood once again. Yeah, yeah, man. They feel like family at this point. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, so the next two weeks, just to give you guys a heads up, the next two weeks we'll do normal episodes because, remember, it's a two-week two week break. So you have the race this week, two off weeks, and then the third week is the actual uh, Belmont. Yeah. So make sure you check out our website, distantreplaypodcast.com. We'll have this race, the Preakness, along with the Kentucky Derby, and eventually we'll have – the Belmont up there on our website as well if you want to watch it as it originally aired in 1973 on CBS. It's a great broadcast and a lot of fun. And this one, especially, there's a lot to this broadcast in just 45 minutes. So I would recommend checking it out. It's an incredible watch. That'll do it for us, Mike. Again, hit subscribe on the podcast. Uh, like our channel. Subscribe to the channel. Like this video. And uh, follow us wherever it is you listen to podcasts. We'll be back again soon with another episode of the show. Until next time.